Hi, and welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Winter Circle Sports Betting Show. Here we are on the Winter Circle Sports Betting Channel, and we welcome all of you who are joining us today, and we appreciate each and every one of you. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, folks, take a second to do so. Subscribe button right beneath you, or you'll see a WC logo in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you're on your PC, just click on that. It's absolutely free to do so. And then take one step further. If you're new or you haven't done this as a uh, current subscriber, uh, go into your YouTube settings, hit that alert notification bell for the Winter Circle Sports Betting Channel, and uh, you'll be notified immediately upon any of our five to six podcasts going up here on a uh, daily basis. Anyway, uh, I am joined today by Mr. Jesse Shule and Sean Higgs, and I'm Ross Benjamin, all three of us of gamblersworld.net. Folks, again, uh, bringing you up to speed on the special we have at gamblersworld.net right now. 149 is our Sweet 16 special. And not only you'll get the uh, Sweet 16, the Elite 8, the Final Four, and the uh, NCAA Championship game, but also all the other tournaments as well, the NIT at CBI and CIT. Uh, but, you know, even if you just want to narrow it down to the NCAA tournament, there's 15 games still yet to be played, and there's eight games yet to be played in the NIT. So take advantage of that offer over at gamblersworld.net. And that uh, that subscription plan is guaranteed. If you don't win, you don't make a profit, we will credit your account back the exact amount of your purchase price. Jesse Shule, my man, uh, how goes it, my friend? Well, I'm not going to lie to you, Ross. There was a few days there last week where it was tough to get out of bed. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a great week. The the NCAA tournament starts, and uh, yeah, I had a terrible start to the tournament. But uh, I posted on Twitter this morning. Uh, don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. We're we're back uh, on the trending up. So uh, that's that's where we like to be. It, it's unfortunate. I uh, I feel bad about uh, some poor results last week. But it, I mean, at the end of the day, anybody who's betting with us needs to know that. This is always a possibility and there's always ups and downs in the business. And uh, I can't, I, I've told people, I can't apologize because if, if, if you're not ready for this, you, you shouldn't be gambling. No, it, it, look, nobody wins every day. We've professed this time and time again. Uh, you know, we could have seven winning days in a row here on our podcast. And if we have an 0-2 or 0-3 like we had last week, uh, there's always the wise crackers that come in and can't wait to uh, put the LOLs and, and the hysterically laughing uh, mojos and all that kind of stuff up on, on the channel. But it is what it is, folks. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, if you do a Google search on Ross Benjamin Sports, Jesse Shule Sports and Sean Higgs, you'll see a plethora of information on all three of us uh, and also uh most of the comments you're going to see on all three of us are uh, positive. And, and, you know, and certain instances, somebody might have caught us at the wrong time uh, that's a little disgruntled, and uh, that goes with the territory. Anyway, Sean, how are you? I'm pretty good. I am pretty good. You know, I want to come back with Jesse's LL Cool J reference. I'm trying to think of what I was going to use. This is <laughs> way above your head, Ross, we're talking about LL Cool J. He was, he was more... 90s version. I'm, I'm thinking I was going to go with like a, I'm that type of guy, or perhaps doing it well. Uh, reference and and people in the chat will maybe know that in in the in the comment section. You not so much. It's okay. Um, but yeah, what's there to say about the SEA tournament? Getting out of bed. To me, yeah, I, I got out of bed. I mean, 18 and 19 for me in, in the first round. And I'm on. And to be perfectly honest, I'm happy I wasn't like five and 22 with with the way the favorites covered at a ridiculous pace so uh it had been like this <laughs> my season i had a great couple uh like a, a a four or five week run at the end of february into starting the ncaa tournament i thought this is going to be good i was not expecting a just absolute favorite beat down of not only forget about straight up winners okay i get it the straight up money line crew they're very happy uh ats winners on top of that just uh they were 32 and 11 coming into sunday or something like that i mean it's ridiculous. I, yeah, the I'll tell you, folks. I'm, and I'm sure I. Most people I see on Twitter say, "Oh my God, this tournament! They're 
more like the I mean, we're, we're, we're pros that other people are having a tough time in that. So I'm like, that's that's not shocking when the favorites go go th- whatever they go 35 and five straight up or whatever ridiculous number they had and uh, ah, it happens. It happens. Yeah, you know, like we talked about this on yesterday's show with Doug Upstone. Um, I mentioned there was uh, eight uh, double digit seeds that advanced to the round of 32 and there was only five last year but only one of those advanced and that was nc state um and you know they're from a power conference you know so what we're lacking here is wonder conference (laughs) yeah i i mean what's lacking here is is that mid-major or two that normally sneaks into the sweet 16 and uh, creates a little bit of a cinderella type of identity and I, it's sorry. I guess you could say NC State is how come? How you know? Again, yeah, they're Cinderella. They wouldn't have been in the tournament if they didn't win the ACC tournament. They won five games in five days. The only other team to do that was UConn, and guess what? UConn won a national championship that year. Um, but again, I, I, you'd be hard pressed to convince me NC State is capable of going on that same run. I give them a lot of credit. Uh, having said that, Sean, you're right. I mean, with these favorites, it's it's like Chalk City, and uh, I'm sure the squares are licking their chops right yeah. now because easy, uh, easy money. And, easy. and I'm sure the sports books uh, took a little bit of a beating. You know, anytime the favorites come in like that, I was fortunate. I had one underdog that cashed in for me with the uh, Texas A&M Aggies against Houston, and you know, again, my big concern with Houston. They put up a lot of points. Texas A&M gave up a lot of points down the stretch. They got in a lot of high-scoring affairs. But my big concern with Houston, guys, is they foul way too much. I mean, look it. They sent Texas A&M to the foul line, I believe, 47 times. Yeah, I know the game went overtime, but even in regulation, that was a high total. And Texas A&M bailed them out by missing 14 free throws. Um you know, in in they showed Texas A and M showed that you know uh, they were they're a great offensive rebounding team too. So Houston, to me, I mean, again, I, Jesse, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Is not a number one seed that scares me right now. Are they a great team? Absolutely, but to me, they have more vulnerabilities than the other three number one seeds. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with that, but I will pick up where you guys left off on all the favorites winning. That actually doesn't bother me when the favorites win because uh, as you say, Ross, you trust the bookmakers more than you trust the uh, public. And when the bookmakers have a team favored and and they win, I I can't complain about that. I find that an easier environment to navigate than when uh, you're getting these double digit dogs upset winners in the first round. That's what I consider harder to predict. But what actually bothers me the most is all the overs cashing. And, uh, you know, the public, they like their overs as much as they like their favorites. And uh, that doesn't work well for me. I, I've been getting uh, touched up pretty bad betting unders in this tournament so far. And uh, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, switch that up here today. Yeah, the deeper you go into the tournament, the, uh, the, the defensive intensity and the screws tighten. So just keep an eye on that going forward. Uh, yeah, trust in the odds maker, you know, uh, I think it's a bad analogy that you just used in terms of how I like to use that phrase. And I say that with the utmost respect. Uh, Trusting the odds maker isn't trusting who they make the favorite to cover the game. It's taking a look at the line and seeing something that looks inordinate. Um, But again, uh, I don't think the odds makers, to be honest with you, Jesse, the odds makers don't want to see all the favorites cover. You know what I'm saying? It's not to their advantage. It now becomes a no-brainer situation where guys like us that bet more money and our clients that bet more money uh, can't hurt them. It's the average. They know they're going to get it back, though, because whenever you see, like we just saw the favorites went 15-1 and straight up in the round of 32, you can bet your bottom dollar that the public will be all over the favorites at any price in uh, in the Sweet 16. So the bookmakers know they'll get their money back. By the way, we're going to be discussing three Sweet 16 matchups that all go on Thursday. I'll be looking at North Carolina, Alabama, uh, Sean Clemson in Arizona, and uh, Sean, I'm sorry, San Diego State, UConn, and Jesse will be looking at Clemson in Arizona. 
Uh, before we get to that, Sean, any f uh, final thoughts? I was going to say, talking about, oh, I'm trusted in the bookmakers. Yeah, I did. I had Nevada as a favorite as a lower seed. New Mexico, Texas Tech as a short fave. Florida Atlantic as a spot they couldn't maybe not cover. And, yeah, don't I'm even, on the opposite don't side. Don't even of bring up the Florida Atlantic game. That, we, we were talking about it on the live show. Oh and Ross goodness. says, oh, I chalked that up as a winner. I said, not the way my luck's going, Ross. They had, oh, my goodness. It was 20 to 19 at halftime. The game ends up going over the number. They needed 103. Then the game goes overtime. That's what killed you. Well, um, no, even, when the, even when the game went to overtime, I would have been a 10 to 1 favorite to still get the under in yeah, overtime. Yeah. But they, they scored, they scored an astronomical amount of points in overtime on top they of scored, it. They scored 26 points in a five minute overtime period. They scored 29 points in the first 20 minutes of the game. It's no. uh, <laughs> go figure. No, welcome to the world of sports betting. And, and, and Houston, and, and real fast on Houston, as much as like you brought up their bad points, I look at it as wow, they didn't unfold. Like you think yeah. that game's going, they're collapsing and they're losing by 10 in overtime. You know, that's a spot you think that team would collapse. At, you know, they, they were pretty much Who was losing eight. by 10 in overtime. I'm saying like Houston after uh -oh. that game gets forced into overtime the way that game ended. I mean, I was I, with, I had AM in the points. The way yeah. that game ended, I'm thinking Houston is losing out right here. Yeah. Like that's I, I the way the tournament had gone. Florida Atlantic was losing by 10 in overtime. Yeah. Yeah. Oregon right. lost by 13 in overtime. Said hold my beer. Watch this. I could do worse than losing by 10 in overtime. I mean, yeah. I lost, lost by 13. By, yeah. I had uh I had Dayton against uh Arizona, I had plus nine and a half in that game. They lose by 10. You oh, know? Yes. Grand Canyon, I, uh, the game is you. Grand Canyon. I had and the, the game was tied with two minutes, two and a half minutes to go. And they lose by 11. Grand Canyon's another team. You know, I, I have no idea what they were doing. The announcers said it best. Uh, it was a cluster. There's a four letter word that I'm not going to use. What describes their offense because their spacing was horrible. And uh, they couldn't make free throws. And this is a team that's a good free throw shooting team. They went 23 out of 37 from the free throw line. You get to the free throw line that many times. Number one, there's a good chance you're winning the game because teams are following you yes. uh, to extend the game. But when you, you get to the free throw line 37 times like Grand Canyon did and 40-something times like Texas A&M did and you don't win the game, that's very, very unusual, folks, and you have nobody to blame but yourself if you lose that because one of Sean's pet peeves, I'm not expecting a team to hit 90%, but if you hit 70%, you win those games. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, yeah, it is what it is. All right, let's get to the meat and potatoes. All right, let's start with uh, Sean today. San Diego State and UConn, um, one thing we could say, which is an absolute lock, is there will be no – uh, rematch in the NCAA championship game that we saw last year because these two teams are squaring off in the Sweet 16. And uh, UConn right now is a heavy 11-point favorite with the total at 136. San Diego State is who they is, and um, they've looked good in the first two rounds. Uh, UConn, um, they just blew, t blew the drawers off both of their overmatched opponents in the first two rounds. Sean, what's your take here? Yeah, and I, you know, I'm gonna come back to what I had in with UConn in the first two games, and it didn't get there. The overs, because I think UConn is just that good offensively, and they're rolling over people. Uh, Northwestern couldn't even. I, I thought Northwestern would get to 60, and I'm thinking this should be an easy over. And now I got San Diego State, same kind of low total here. And now, granted, this score was what last year, 76-59 in the championship game. I think San Diego State's not as good, but I think UConn's probably as good as better. Yeah. I'm going to go over the total again. I'm going over, and I, I, I like UConn, but I'm going to go over because I think UConn's going to score their 75, 80 points. And San Diego State, although maybe not as good, they're going to put up their points they have all season. So I'm expecting them to put up a 65 piece and get us this over. I'm, UConn is by far, I think, the best team. I mean, we, and believe it or not, I, you know, I know that Purdue gets their kind of hate, but th they have to show you something in their last couple games blowing out teams. But for me, UConn, it's UConn and everybody else. I don't think they're. They lose a game. It's because the defense fails, and it's it's a crazy game in the eighties. I'm I'm going over here. I think this game is eighty sixty five. You know. All right. Yeah. Um, you know the other good thing for you when it comes to the over, Sean, is 
they blew out Northwestern, yet UConn shot terribly from the three-point line, yeah. uh, which, you know, that's I can't foresee that happening again. Is it possible? Sure. But the likelihood of that happening again, even if they hit 35% of those three-point shots or 31% of their three-point shots, they're going to win by 30 in yes. that game instead of 17. You know, I had UConn in that game, Jesse, and I – and I, they were up 30 with about 11 minutes to go, and I'm going, okay, I don't have to watch that. Next thing I look up, they're only up 15 with two minutes to go. It ended up being sweat, right? They win by 17, thankfully. But anyway, Jesse, your thoughts on uh, Sean's game, which is uh, a rematch of last year's NCAA tournament finals. I'm going to have to disagree with Sean. I don't disagree that UConn's going to get their points, and I do think they're in a league of their own, clearly the best team remaining the best team in the country. Um, and I agree that San Diego State is not as good as they were last year, but I disagree that I think San Diego State's going to get their points. Uh, I look at the team total for San Diego State sitting at 62 and a half. Uh, they scored 59 last year. They're not as good this year. Um, pace of play has changed. San Diego State seems to be playing faster this year, but I'm not sure it's in their best interest to try and do that to UConn. I think their only hope in this game is to muck it up, slow it down, and, and try to escape somehow. Um, and uh, I expect it to be a, a more of a low. Certainly, I don't expect San, uh, San Diego State to get their points. So 62 and a half under the team total for me. All right. So uh, Sean likes the game. Uh, that is San Diego State-UConn to go under 136. Over. Jess, over. I like the over. Over. I'm sorry. 136. And Jesse's the one who has the under on uh, San Diego State under the team total of 62 and a half. So we'll see. I mean, they both could win this game. You know, there's nothing to say that, hey, San Diego State scores 70 in, uh, or 60 and, uh, you know, UConn could put up 75, 80 points. You never know. Anyway, all right, let's get to the next one. And this is an intriguing matchup, Clemson and Arizona. Uh, Arizona right now is a seven and a half point favorite. The total in this game is 152. Clemson's a hard team for me to figure out. Um, they've looked really good in the first two rounds of the tournament, uh, disposing of New Mexico with relative ease, which it's not so shocking they beat New Mexico, Jesse, but in the fashion that they did so. And then they were really good in the second round uh, as well. I mean, so uh, this is a team playing really good over the last two games. But as we saw with Clemson, they, they down the second half of the season, they were very streaky. And uh, they could look really good on one night and lose to a team they had no business losing to uh, three nights later. But in any event, um, it's not important what I think right now. It's important what you think. What's what's your take here? Yeah, Ross, uh, there's, Clemson's definitely taking a step up in competition. Arizona is uh, obviously a little bit better of a team. Uh, 87.6 points per game Arizona averages. That's fourth nationally. Uh, they dominate the boards, 42 and a half rebounds per game, top 10 nationally. They should have a huge edge in rebounding. I, I wanted to take Arizona minus the seven, but the more I looked into it, you look at Clemson and you look at a lot of their losses. They got a lot of losses by one, two, three, four points. They don't have many losses by seven to 10 points. Um, so I, I, I like the, uh, this is going to sound funny, Ross. I like the over in this game, over 152. We talked about uh, unders in the tournament that haven't been great so far. Uh, pace of play, Arizona, 76.4 possessions per game. That's top 10 nationally. Uh, they're playing in an NBA arena at the old Staples Center, and I'll probably call it the Staples Center for another 20 years, just so you know. Apparently, they call it CryptoBros.com Arena or something like that. The kids I call, call it Yelly it Forum. It's okay. Anyway, <laughs> That's what the kids are calling it these days, but I call it the Staples Center. But the point is, it's an NBA arena. It's designed for basketball. There's no issues with depth perception or backdrop. Uh, it actually should favor Arizona being comfortable playing on the West Coast. Uh, you look at Clemson, 79% free throw shooting, one of the best in the country, shooting their free throws. Um and they they're averaging 77.2 points per game, fourth in the SE or ACC, sorry. And uh, Arizona shoots 37.3% from the three point line. I mean, just 
two two teams that score their share of points. They're both great shooting teams. NBA arena, um, fast pace. It all adds up to over 152 to me. All right, Clemson, Arizona, over 152. I would say this, Jesse. Um, if Clemson stays attached, meaning within reasonable distance to Arizona throughout, you're going to have a difficult time getting this over. But if Arizona gets off to a, a great start and uh, Clemson is playing uphill, uh, it's that will be conducive to a more high-scoring game because Clemson likes to play slow, Jesse, and we saw that in the second-round win they had. They could be very frustrating to play against. They play decent defense, and when they get the lead, it's extremely uh, difficult for teams to overcome that because of the style of play. Uh, I also see a guy like Joe Girard has to go crazy uh, for um, uh, for Clemson to stay in this game. He's a terrific three-point shooter. I witnessed him four years uh, locally here at Syracuse and talk about free throw shooter, 93%. Unfortunately, he doesn't get to the line a lot. Um, and uh, the, what's a big white kid's name uh, for Clemson? He's got to stay out of foul trouble. He's an excellent player. Uh, but he, he gets wrapped up emotionally and, and can't seem to stay out of foul trouble. And, and they could ill afford to not have him on on the floor for prolonged periods of time. They got away with it in a round two one or round two win. But against a team like Arizona, you need your best on the floor throughout. Sean, your take? Yeah, I'm torn on this because I had I, I took the points in Clemson. Uh, against Baylor, although I had you know New Mexico in, in, in their first rounder there, I I don't know what to, to take of this game. Uh, part of me wants to take Arizona as the favorite because I just think Arizona is a I got them my little bracket I filled that I got them win a championship. I think they're a really good team. Uh, I haven't pulled the trigger on Arizona total wise. I'm I I, I I get Jesse's point where I think this could be like a 86 75 kind of over game, but on your Side of it for Clemson. Clemson doesn't want to play that game because they're that they're going to get run out of the building in that kind of game. They they can't compete with that. So uh, I haven't pulled the trigger. I do like Arizona though. Nothing nothing for the side to me. Yeah, uh, PJ Hall is a kid's name, by the way. Uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, he needs to. Uh, he was one of the best players in the ACC this year, and uh, he's instrumental to their success. But uh, the kid gets out of control emotionally, and he, he needs to rein it in. You know, I know it's the NCAA tournament, but you're a hell of a lot more valuable on the floor than off the floor. So we'll see what happens there. All right, let me get to my game, um, and that's the uh, Alabama-North Carolina game, which uh, shapes up to be, in my estimation, a very entertaining game to watch. Now, I, you know I love my totals, guys, but this is one I'm not willing to touch because I cannot sit there uh and watch these two teams with the style of play they play uh, and, and expect a low-scoring game. And low scoring might be in the low 160s, high 150s in this contest. Uh, North Carolina is a really underrated defensive team, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, the total right now is 173.5, North Carolina's short four-point favorite. That's not uncustomary for Alabama. And I'll say this, Alabama was extremely fortunate uh, against Grand Canyon because Grand Canyon just played undisciplined offensively and missed a ton of free throws. In Alabama, uh, there's a little bit of correlation between Alabama and Houston in respect. Both play aggressive defense, and it's just not their prior games that they send uh, teams at a free throw line on a regular basis. They've played that way all year. Now, having said that, it was an inordinate amount of free throws that both of their opponents got in the last game and that they need to clean that up, especially against a North Carolina team uh, that hits 75% uh, of their free throws on the year. And they're at 79% over their last five games. Uh, uh, this is a favorable matchup. Um, Bama's in, 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 as opposed to the first two uh, opponents too. I mean, they've had favorable matchups, I should say, uh, in their first three rounds, I mean, number one, they played Charleston, who likes to play up tempo, and then uh, Grand Canyon was the opposite. Uh, it ended up being the opposite, but Grand Canyon doesn't shy away from playing fast if you want to. But in this particular matchup, North Carolina could beat you in any way you want to play, and uh, I think that's going to be. I don't think North Carolina will shy away from an up tempo game that Alabama likes to play at. 
I, I do believe the difference in this game will come down to uh, North Carolina. It's got the ability uh, to get several stops more than Alabama because they're a better defensive team. They're, they're more disciplined defensively. And, uh, you know, Alabama, their last seven games, they're allowing – uh, 34.7 free throw attempts per game. I just mentioned that. That's a concern. And they've also allowed 88 plus points in nine of their last 12 games. So um, the only thing that scares me here, guys, is this seems like a very short number uh, for a number one seed. But again, Alabama's received a lot of hype this year. And they, you know, when you look, they pass the eye test because they're so dynamic and talented offensively and her ability to knock down threes. But I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with North Carolina here. Uh, I like in, in Alabama, this is their third time in a sweet 16 since 2021 with uh, Nate Oaks in charge. And uh, the prior two, they went 0 and two straight up in ATS, make it 0 and three straight up in ATS and their last three uh, sweet 16 appearances. Give me North Carolina here uh, over Alabama. Sean. I'm um, I like Alabama. Believe it or not, I just you know talked about their defense and it's been bad and everybody's just so down on it, right? It's like oh, it's terrible. They're not gonna have a shot to go anywhere. I'm I'm taking Alabama. I got Alabama plus four already. To be honest with you, we're not yet. Yeah, plus four I, mean, total. Yeah. I I just think it's a uh, not a go get. And I I thought NC State is uh, NC State. North Carolina is a Final Four type team. I said all year I thought they were an elite team. They're experienced, been here before. Everything, all the things that check the boxes, they got it. They got it going on. And Alabama, they got everything checked the boxes except for the defense. I, I don't know. This for me, it's a kind of anti going against the the defensive hatred of Alabama. So sign me up for Bama and four here in this spot. And uh, I think we lost Ross, Jesse. So I don't know. If you yeah, are. Ross likes North Carolina. Sean likes Alabama. So that we know you're coming with a total. I get to play judge and jury here. I'm, I'm excited about it. I noticed on our last show uh, we upset some Big Ten fans, so I thought I would uh, rekindle our turbulent relationship with SEC fans, and I'm going to say that I think Alabama is a fraud. Uh, if you look at the stats for Grand Canyon, 32.1% uh, from the field, 10% from the three-point range, 62% from the free throw line. Alabama's not going to get that against North Carolina. Uh, we've seen the SEC struggle so far in the tournament. Alabama was at best inconsistent. I know they've got a great offense. Defensively questionable, even though they're, I mean, I guess they're pretty good when their opponent shoots 10% from beyond the arc, but <laughs> I don't think they can count on that against North Carolina. Like Ross said, you look at this line, it looks way short. But uh, I'm going to trust myself on this one, and uh, I'm going to take North Carolina. Yeah, I mean, Jesse, if you stop and think about it, I mean, I, I went three and two on Sunday, but I had North, I had um, Grand Canyon plus the six. That was my top play. And if you hold Alabama to 72 points, the way they play defense, terrible. I mean, speaking of Alabama, you got to win the game. And then you, you get to the free throw line 37 times beside Alabama was extremely fortunate, in my opinion. So we'll see. But, you know, I, Sean, I'm going against everything I profess because the line looks short and it looks like they're begging you to take uh, North Carolina here. But I just can't get beyond it, the balance that North Carolina has between offense and defense. I mean, you look at their number 16 offensively at, at Kempom and number six defensively. Now, Alabama's up there offensively, but not to, not not even close defensively. So we'll see what happens. But our official picks anyway, I'm taking North Carolina minus the four over Alabama. Um, and Sean likes San Diego State and UConn to go over the total of 136. And Jesse, Je the stop the presses. Jesse likes an over. He likes Clemson, Arizona. Over 152, Jesse says, you kick my ass in the first two rounds with these unders. I'm not going to get outsmarted this time. I'm going over, baby. So there you have it. There's our three picks for uh, Tuesday. As our three picks for Thursday, I'm sorry. We are recording on Tuesday for Thursday, the 28th of March. And uh, look forward to tomorrow when I have these two gentlemen back with me. 
and we're going to be discussing some Friday Sweet 16 action. Um, and I'll have Jesse and Doug who will be filling in for Sean on, on Friday on our live show. We'll be talking uh, lead eight at that time. Uh, Thursday, I will have Chip Chirimbus rejoins us. We'll be talking a little bit of NBA on Thursday with Chip. Also on Thursday, myself and Doug will be covering a couple Major League Baseball games. And I know Sean is chomping at the bit and saying, why did you assign Major League Baseball to Doug and not me? And uh, But you'll have your fair share of opportunities. I got. I think I got two three-packs up already for, for Thursday, and I think eight games total for Thursday baseball. On the there side. you go. Right off the bat, firing, 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 as Jim Quinn likes to say. In any event, uh, for Jesse, well, let's get to this real quick. Jesse, there's a like button. Smash that like button. Smash that like button, folks. Just a small token of your appreciation for the time, work, and effort we put in to bringing you a quality podcast each and every day and to making you a smarter sports better today than you were yesterday. Until tomorrow, uh, when I'm back with these two gentlemen, for Jesse Shule, Sean Higgs, and Ross Benjamin, have a fantastic day, guys.